Welcome to the Known Victory Church YouTube channel. We are so glad that you found us today. We exist to make Jesus known and to be a place that anyone can call home. If you haven't yet, make sure to subscribe, like, and share these messages so we can truly make Jesus known in our homes, cities, and across the world. We pray that this message impacts you and helps you to grow closer to Jesus. I don't remember if you remember this trend. I don't even know if I'd call it a trend, but this, there's this moment back in, you know, a few years ago, maybe 12 years ago, when the Fitbit was like taking over the world. You know what I'm talking about? And what was really fascinating about it is that we would be in competitions with one another on who would take the most steps in a day. You remember that? Maybe you don't remember this, but what I remember is that my mom and my, sis- and my sister-in-law, they would be- were competing for steps. And so if we'd go, say, to their house to watch a movie, they'd look at their Fitbit or their app on their phone and realize, I don't have enough steps for today. And you know what they would do? You guys know this. What they would do is they would stand up behind our couch and start walking on the spot like this. Do you guys remember this? People, some people still do this, and I know that. But, and so, like, we'd be watching a two-hour movie, and my mom and sister-in-law are just walking behind us. Like, in any other context, I would have been scared for my life, right? But because it was in the comfort of my own home, this was happening. And this was this fascination um, with steps. And for most people, uh, the goal for steps uh, would be 10,000 a day. That's what a lot of people hope to get in a day. And I was doing some research, and this is so fascinating. In the year 1900, the average person walked a total of 26,000 steps a day in 1900. And, you know, obviously we've, a lot of technology and things have come that have kind of changed the way that just life is lived. But today, on average, people take only 5,300 steps a day. So it's like 21,000 more steps that people used to take like 120 years ago than we do today. That's like just irrelevant information, but now you know. Um, and in and, and 5,300 steps, it's an interesting statistic, um, but we've been in the series uh, called Samson the past couple Sundays, and I want to encourage you, if you've missed it, I want to encourage you to listen to it. I think um, some of the things that I believe God is speaking to us as a church really powerfully um, over the past couple weeks, and I think he's going to continue uh, to speak moving forward. I want to encourage you to go to our YouTube page or our Facebook or whatever and find it and listen to it. I feel like there's a lot of things that we can learn uh, from it, but When we look at Samson, I think the question we have to ask is, what caused Samson to fall? What was it? Was there a moment that caused him to fall? And if we think about it, if I was to ask us, what woman caused Samson to fall? I think we would all know the name Delilah. We know, okay, yeah, Delilah was this woman who caused Samson to fall. That's how we know the story that Delilah, she she seduced Samson and he told her his secret. He told her about his hair and he got his hair cut. And what happened was he lost his strength. That's how we know the story. But the truth is much deeper than just this moment with Delilah It's much deeper than that because the reality is that when it comes to his life, it wasn't just a moment that happened. It was small steps that he was taking to get to that place. Step after step, day after day, moment after moment, walking and going places. And and it was small steps that he took in his life that caused him his failure, that caused him his pain, that caused him to actually lose his life. Samson started taking these steps away from his calling long before Delilah. Delilah was just kind of the the end part of the story, and that's the part of the story we know super well, and that's what we learn about. But there's so much more in this story of Samson that I want to encourage you, if you have some time, to read through the the stories of Samson because there's so much in it um, that I think... We just don't really talk about, but there's so many things that we can learn. But, but in life, when it comes to failure, when it comes to us falling, as much as Samson fell, it doesn't often happen just in a moment. It's small steps that we take daily that get us to where we go, that either get us to the places we want to go or get us to the places that we don't want to go. Our downfall doesn't happen in a moment. Addiction doesn't start in a moment. It takes small steps in the wrong direction that lead us to those moments. See, Delilah, she was kind of the end of the road for Samson. But there's so many other steps that he took before that that actually led him in this direction. And if we go to Judges chapter 16, which we were in Judges 14, this, this, uh, last week, this week, Judges chapter 16, this is how it starts. Judges chapter 16 starts by saying this. One day, Samson went to Gaza. 
It's a very simple start of this story, right? That one day Samson went to Gaza. In the original language here, that word went actually meant like walked. So what this is saying really is that Samson walked to Gaza. Now, in, in our country, we don't really understand the distance that is. Like to walk from his hometown to Gaza where he was going, where he went, where he walked, was 45 miles that he walked to get to Gaza. 45 miles or 72.4 kilometers from his hometown to Gaza where he was going. And that's about 90,000 steps that he took to get to Gaza, 90,000 steps. That's like if one day you went on my social media and I'd said, hey guys, today I walked to, uh, to Westlock be a very similar context. Like that's not a short distance. It's like one day I walked to Westlock and you might be asking, why would you walk to Westlock? Why would anyone go to Westlock? I don't know. Now maybe you're from Westlock and I've only been there once. And what happened was I was with my friend and we were in the McDonald's parking lot and his car got hit and then the police came and there's this crazy story that happened in Westlock. Okay, that's random thoughts for today. 90,000 steps he walked. So how does a man as strong as Samson falls so powerfully, the answer is one step at a time. Because if we continue in this story, one day Samson went to Gaza, and what did he find when he went to Gaza? Let's read it. It says, one day Samson went to Gaza where he saw what? He saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her. You know, this isn't where he wants to be, right? Right? This is, he's walking 90,000 steps. The first thing he sees is a prostitute. He's going to a place he's not even supposed to go to. He walks and he sees a prostitute and he went to spend the night with her. Remember, this is Samson's kryptonite, his woman, right? This is the thing that he's always catching his eye, his, his woman. He wants something sweet, so he sees it and he goes after it. 45 miles, 90 thousand steps and what this is you look at 90,000 steps what are this these are 90,000 opportunities for Samson to turn around these are 90,000 opportunities for Samson to say well I probably shouldn't be going this direction I'm going the wrong way one step at a time 90,000 opportunities it might be 90,000 clicks on the internet might be 90,000 calories or $90,000 where we know our time, our energy is not supposed to go to, but that's where our minds go. That's where our wallets go, 90,000. We don't want to turn around. We don't want to run back to safety because what's in front of us, it seems pleasurable. It seems like something we will enjoy and we don't think about the consequence. We just think about the prize and we, we go after the things that we desire, 90,000 steps. You know, I think about most of us in life, when we look at a five-year, maybe you have a five-year or a 10-year plan, most of us, alcohol addiction isn't part of our five-year plan. Most of us, pornography addiction is not part of our five or 10-year plan, but what happens is it's one step, one step after another that lead us to these moments. We don't plan for addiction, but if we don't plan against it, it's very common for it to occur in our life. You know, a lot of us were looking, I didn't think I'd be in this much debt before I turned 30, or I didn't think I'd be in this much debt in my 50s. I didn't think that this is what my life was going to be like. I didn't think this was going to be it. But how do we know we get to those places is one step at a time. We're going to go through this story together and see some of the small steps that Samson took that led him to his demise and steps that I think some of us we might be taking even right now. And number one is this, is that we underestimate our enemy. We underestimate our enemy. We underestimate the danger that we might be in. We might not even realize it. Because if we continue in the story, verse two says this, the people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. And you see there's an exclamation mark. They're surprised. Like, like, why did Samson come here? Is he foolish? He's by himself. He came here. We got the army. Like, like, what is he doing? Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay and wait for him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night saying, at dawn, we'll kill him. 
In the morning, we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Around midnight, he wakes up. Now we can imagine this scene, at least I imagine the scene. Samson, he gets out of the bed with this prostitute and he's midnight. He's like, okay, I better sneak out. And so he, he kind of creeps downstairs. He opens the door. What does he see in front of him? Potentially like a hundred soldiers sleeping on the ground. Like a hundred soldiers with their swords. And I can imagine him walking through the door being like, this could have been really bad. Like this could have been really bad. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run home and I'm going to repent and I'm going to go back. I'm going to go back to where I should be. And, and, and I'm, God, I'm sorry. Like I shouldn't be here. This could have been way worse than it is. I can imagine that's how my mind would think about it. Oh, I'm in trouble. Kind of this wake up call to like shoot. Like this could have been way worse than it is. This could have been way more painful. This could have been way more detrimental to me than it is. But I see it now, so I'm going to walk away. But that's not at all how Samson responds. This is what Samson does. And this is absolutely mind-boggling. It says, Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them over his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. That's a classic guy response, right? Like, I'm in trouble. I'm just going to go break something. I'm going to go just rip the entire city gate off of its hinges. I'm going to take the whole thing. You think you can get me? You think that your, your little soldiers sleeping on the ground with their swords are a match for me? Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take away your protection for your city. Watch what I can do. Look how powerful I am. I'm going to pick up your entire city gate and rip it from the wall and carry it up the hill. And now, like, we're not talking about the gate that leads to your garden with your roses and sunflowers. Like, this is a city gate. Some scholars, and I, it's hard to fathom, but some scholars think this gate weighed anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 pounds. So imagine the soldiers wake up. Where's our gate? Like, where did it go? Now, maybe they woke up when he's ripping it off of it. I don't know. We don't get those details, but... Imagine this moment. He's carrying it up, and it's not like he was carrying it a couple blocks. They, they, they say, scholars say, that it was about 35 miles uphill or 56 kilometers uphill that he carried this gate. Now, how many of us, when we're in trouble, that's what we do as well? Look what I can do. Look, like, like, you can't get me. You're not strong enough. Look how powerful I am. I'm going to carry your entire gate on my shoulders. Look at me. Look what I can do. Rather than admit his weakness, what does he do? He shows off. Watch me. Don't even try and get me. You cannot do it. I can't be stopped. It's just a few soldiers. He's bragging, throwing it in their face. But do you know what he's doing? He's underestimating his enemy. And do you know, we do the same thing. Some of the things that we know are vices in our life or the things that we know are things we struggle with deeply. We underestimate the power that they can have over us. We might say, yeah, but it's just my, it's my one thing. It's the one thing that I do. We see ourselves as more powerful than our kryptonite. That's what Samson did, right? I'm strong enough, right? Remember the excuses, the attitudes from last week? I can handle it. I want it. They get in the way. Our attitude gets in the way. And we think that we can do it on our own. And we think we, we're powerful. And then our enemy keeps coming and coming. Because we're not being careful what we're, the music that we're listening to. We're not being careful about the videos that we're watching. We don't have any plans to protect our phones or protect our computers. We say, I can go to the bar. I can handle it. I'm just going to drink water. It's no problem. I can stop at the gas station for a lottery ticket. No problem. I can handle it. I can handle having that substance in my house. It's only for my guests. I don't touch it. It's not for me. It shouldn't be a problem. And then what happens, if you know this, and we've all, I feel like we've all experienced this, is that we're so ashamed that we can't talk to anybody else about it. If you go through the life of Samson, do you know what he was? He was alone. He's always alone. Unless he found a woman, right? 
The question is, do we understand who our enemy is? And this is what First Peter says about our enemy. It says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. He's seeking someone to devour, someone taking small steps. You might not be taking these big steps, but the small steps, they lead you somewhere. He's looking for someone to devour. So what does it say? Be watchful. Be sober-minded. Be humble. Don't underestimate your enemy. And then the second step that I think he did a lot, and we do the same as we rationalize the same old sin. How could Samson fall to the same thing over and over and over again? Right, he falls to that woman in Judges chapter 14. And then, all of, then right now in Judges 16, he falls to this prostitute as he walked, saw her, and he went after her. How could he do this? Would he do it again? And this is Judges 16, 4. This is what it says. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. After this, right, after he rips the wall out, he fell in love with a, in the, with a woman in the valley. And then we think, as we read the story in hindsight, we think, man, like, Samson, like, are you, like, like, don't do it. Like, don't do it. You ever watch a movie and you're like, don't do it. And they don't listen to you. But if they did, it wouldn't really be a movie, you know. Like, I, I, ever, I watch a movie sometimes and I'll watch it and I'm like, man, this movie would be so much better if nothing bad happened. And it's always, I find this, especially in, like, romantic movies, comedies, it's like, Everything's perfect up until like 20 minutes before the movie's over. And then there's like a horrible, devastating moment. Five minutes later, they're running into an airport and loving each other again. But he says, well, how we look at him and say, Samson, don't do it. Don't do it. I'm strong. He says, I can handle that. I'm strong. No one can touch me. Nothing can stop me. I want it. I'm going to get it. What are you going to do about it? Right? That's his attitude is what are you going to do? I ripped your entire city gate off. What are you going to do? It's my one habit. It's my one thing. It's not a big deal. Everyone else is doing it. It's not a problem. It's not harming anyone else. I'm enjoying it. It feels good. Do you ever have this language in your own mind? I can do what I want. It's not that bad. No one will ever know. It's in secret. It's not hurting anyone, right? These are the attitudes, these thoughts that go through our minds. Then we think that what happens in secret can't hurt anybody else, right? That's what we think. But do you know what happens with sin in our life that's secret no one knows about? Do you know what it hurts is you. It hurts your relationship with Jesus. And maybe you've heard the saying before, hurt people hurt people. You ever heard that? How true is that? How often when we're hurt are we the ones hurting other people? That the secret sin that we thought was just us is now affecting our relationship with our spouse or or affecting our relationship with our children. Because when we're hurt, we're going to hurt people. It hurts our soul. It interferes with our relationship with Jesus. And some of us, I think, are even here today, and this is us, the secret sin of somebody else has devastated us. The sin that they thought was just theirs has actually festered and come into our lives because we've been hurt by those people. We feel betrayed. We feel threatened. We we feel shame. How did I not know? How could I not see the signs? We feel this. It might harm your intimacy with your spouse. It might harm your saving plan. It It might harm your relationship with your children because we can no longer be present. It might harm our future. Because we say, but it's okay. It's only a few hundred dollars a month. She doesn't need to know. Once I win the lottery with it, then I'll tell her because then we're rich. These are attitudes we have. Again, from last week, I want it. I deserve it. I can handle it. But then there's this, another question that we have that comes in our minds. It says this, is it really wrong? Is it really a sin? So we Google it. Is this a sin? You ever Google that? I, I have. Like, I don't know. Like, maybe you haven't. I don't know. Maybe I'm just crazy. 
is this, is this a sin? And remember, this is the language that comes right in Genesis. Genesis chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Did he say that? Is it really that bad? You know what we're good at is convincing ourselves that our sin is actually okay. We're actually great at convincing ourselves that, that the things that we do that no one knows, it's fine. Did God really say, I'll deal with the consequences myself. I'm strong. I think this leads us to the next, the next um, step that sometimes we take is this, is that we, all, we overlook obvious warning signs. Now this is real, because what, because you ever see someone in a relationship that you know is like not good? And you're like, bro, like, how do you not see it? Like, how do you not see it? But there's a weird thing about men in love that we don't see anything. We're blind, right? We're like, oh, everything's perfect. She's the best. Now I'm not saying like personally, like Beth and I, are, we're good, right? Like we're, we're good, <laughs> And what happens is the story continues as the Philistines, they catch wind that Samson is really into Delilah. It's like, oh, we got it. So what they say is, this, this comes up in the Judges 16, 5, says this, the rulers of the Philistines went to Delilah to her and said, see if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his strength and how we can overpower him. So that way we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you 1,100 shekels of silver. You know what the equivalent of that today is like over a million dollars. Like a bribe, a million dollars. They're saying, show us Samson's strength. Where does he get it from? You, you can do it. Seduce him. Do whatever it takes. Get the secret. That way we can subdue him. That way we can do it. And it's funny because we read this now and we're like, man, Samson, you got to get, get your mind figured out, man. Because this is what it says. This is, this is Delilah's tactic. So Delilah said to Samson, tell me the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. That's, that's what she asks him. Like, it's not like, hey, like, you know, like, what about this? It's like, Teach me how you, why you're strong so I can tie you up and subdue you and hopefully we can kill you. He's like, great idea. Like, <laughs> let's, let's, let's try it out. Imagine you're on a first date with someone. Conversation is going well. You're thinking, hey, this could be the person for me. This could be the one. And then she hits you up with this line. If I was gonna tie you up and kill you, what would be the best way to make that happen? Imagine that. Like, you'd be like, see, a police are called to like, Straight to jail, you know what I'm talking about? Like, whoa, like, you don't say that. But again, men, when they're in love and when they're, you know, excited, we, do, we don't see. Samson has posed this question four times. Four times. And we think, how could anyone be so dumb, so blind to what's happening right in front of them? You would think Samson would get the hint. How can we tie you up and subdue you? How? But he just doesn't see it. He doesn't hear it. He doesn't understand it. There's a lot of warning signs. But we're often so blinded by pleasure, we're blinded by pride, and we're blinded by lust that we don't even see it happening right in front of us. We don't see it in front of us. I want to ask us a question today is this, is there any area in your life that you're looking, overlooking the obvious warning signs? In whatever area in your life you want to put it in, are you overlooking obvious warning signs? And that might be people, people telling you, don't do it. It might be looking at your health and realizing, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm a lot less healthy than, the, than I wish I was. I mean, the small steps that we took to get there. And are there obvious warning signs in your life? What are they? It might be in your health or it might be in your finances. It might be sexually. 
It could be mentally, it could be the relationship, and I don't know, but are you overlooking obvious warning signs? And then the last step that Samson took, and we do this, is that we ignore the cost. We ignore the cost. And I think that what could be the saddest verse in this whole story, that even when he knows he's broken the vow, right? He's, he's told her. Again, if you read it, you'll read the story, but he tells her. I think this is the saddest part of the story. It says this in verse 20. Then she called Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And this has happened before. It says, this is so sad. He says, he awoke from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. I'll go out as before. Nothing's changed. I'm still strong. I'm still powerful. I can handle it. I'll be okay. I'll figure it out. And then the next part of this verse says this, but he did not know that the Lord had left him. He did not know that the Lord had left him. The cost was big. He didn't count it. He ignored the cost. He had ignored it. And what happened is the Lord had left him. And it cost him the most valuable thing. It wasn't his strength that was most valuable. It was his intimacy with God. It was gone. That's the cost. That's the problem. Hidden sin in our lives is the ability to remove connection from God. Not because of him, but because of us. We're running in the wrong direction. 90,000 steps. And I wonder how many of us today are operating out of our own strength and we don't even realize that God's strength has left us. That we're so, our minds are so confused and we're so broken in our own minds that we don't even realize that the intimacy that we used to have, the strength that we used to have, the prayer life we used to have, the, the, the relationship that we used to have with God is slowly starting to become a distant memory, not something that we're living out every day in the moment. Because what happens is this leaves us incredibly weak and vulnerable for attack. The very next verse, verse 21, says this. Then the Philistine seized him and gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to grinding grain in the prison. You know, I want you to know, like, as a church and as pastors and as a family, as, as a congregation, we need to be there for each other. Again, Samson was so alone. I think that was his first mistake really was that he didn't have someone to walk alongside him. And as pastors, we want you to know we're here for you. We want to walk alongside you. We want to help you. We, we want to be there for you. And then not even just us as pastors, but as a church, we want to be there for one another. That's our role. But if we don't know, if we don't know what's going on, if we, if we can't help you, if, we, if, if you can't be honest, and it's going to be tough. And that's the same in marriage. And so many of us, we, we, we long for these deep and intimate marriages, but we can't even talk about the most simple things. We're kind of scared to talk about our struggles. And, and, and so interesting because in marriage, that's supposed to be the person that we trust with everything. That's supposed to be the person. And some of us, were so ashamed. We're so caught up in shame that we can't even build that intimacy with the person we love the most. You know, our takeaway today is this, is that where am I stepping away from God? I don't know, in your life, I'm sure we've all had moments. Maybe you're in a moment right now, you... You feel like there's maybe a thing in your life or a situation that you just keep walking towards. And you know you should and you're taking small steps and you're going and you're going and you're like, you don't know, if, like the dilemma of like, I want to stop but I, I don't know if I can. Where am I stepping away from God? And it might be as simple 
as you've stopped reading your Bible on a regular basis and spending time in prayer, something that maybe you used to do every morning or every time at lunch or every evening before bed, that you used to spend this time and you know, slowly just with life and you got busy. And, and it might be a, a big purchase of something you didn't need, but you wanted it and now your credit card is maxed out. It might be a daily habit that is ruining your life. It might be that your screen time is more than your family time. I want to encourage you, let's be honest in our relationship with Jesus. Let's be honest. Like, like I think sometimes we're so scared even to tell God about what we're going through. And he's like, I know, I see it. I know what you're going through. And we're so ashamed that we can't even go to our Father and say, God, I, I need healing. I need you to restore me. You know, some of us, maybe we're in here today and we're feeling guilty today. And, and I, that's not my intention. But the beauty is that it doesn't matter how many steps we are in the wrong direction, whether it's one or 89,000. All we have to do is turn around. All we have to do is turn back around. The Bible calls it repentance, right? Just to repent and turn around, turn from it, and walk back towards where God is. Just turn around. Start the journey back. And Pastor, Pastor Ashley Wooldridge says this. He says, in the midst of a mess, the first step toward a hope is always honesty. In the midst of a mess, whatever mess maybe you find yourself in or your family finds yourselves in, the first step toward hope is honesty. Be honest, be real. That's when hope and healing can come. I want to encourage you, next week we're going to be concluding the series with a message called Overcoming Failure. And I think that this message next week has the power to really shift things in our lives that I've been praying about it and I've been walking through it on my own. The story of redemption, right? This isn't where Samson's story ends. And this isn't even for you. This, this isn't where your story ends. God is in the business of redeeming people and loving people. And being there for people. My hope today is not that we'll leave guilty, but that we'll leave with a better understanding and a plan to get healthy. And I think our job as pastors, our job as followers of Jesus, is to be as healthy as we can be to take care of the other people too. To be as healthy in our souls and as healthy in our minds and it's healthy in our body so that way we can take care of people and walk on them in and, and love them. And, and the same grace and the same redemption that I've received, my prayer is that you can receive it as well. And those who don't call this place home yet, that they can experience the same grace and the same love that, that I have and I know that you have as well. So let's just pray together. God, I thank you that even though we often walk to the wrong places. That even though it seems like what follows us is disaster after disaster sometimes. God, I thank you that no matter how many steps we've taken away from you, you've never left. You're still there every time. So God, help us. Help me. Help me as the pastor of of our church to not underestimate the enemy, to not overlook the, the warning signs, to not ignore the costs, and to not rationalize the same sin in my life. God, today I repent too. I, I come and I say, God, any area of my life that I need to turn around and I need to start bringing closer to you, closer to your heart, God, I pray that you speak that to me and you speak that to us in this place today. And God, we love you and we're so grateful and we're encouraged by you. And God, I pray that none of us leave guilty today. But that God, we leave today with shame gone because we know that you're restoring the most broken of hearts and the most broken of souls today in this moment. God, I pray for everyone sitting here today. I pray for anyone who's watching us online today. 
God, I pray you speak to us. Maybe the parts of our hearts and the parts of our lives that we don't even know we're walking in the wrong direction. God, I pray that you help us understand, help us learn, and help us redirect back to you. And God, I just pray your grace, I pray your love, I pray your joy over us today. God, we love you. And thank you that you are redeeming hearts today. In Jesus' name, amen.